which one would you pay off? Would you pay the mortgage off at 5%, $1,200 a month? Or would you pay the $40,000 credit card off that's 20%, and this is simple interest, that is a lower monthly payment? So the minimum might be lower than your mortgage. Hell, I mean, let's, let's make this even a bigger spread. $1,500 monthly payment on the mortgage and $800 on the credit card. So if you were just focused on the monthly amount, you'd think, all right, well, I'm going to pay the mortgage off. But that was that'd probably be the wrong decision. Because over here, you're never going to get ahead. At least over here, every payment, some of this is going to principal. And chances are at 800 on 40 grand, none of this is going to, to principal. So absolutely pay off the credit card. Take the $800 a month that you used to give you know, to the credit card, pay that 800 as an extra principal payment on the mortgage. Welcome to another week of Wealth Webinar, where Stephen and I are going to really break down one of the biggest things that will destroy you during this upcoming recession. And who can tell me what that is? What is the number one destroyer of your finances and your family's finances going into a recession? Who can tell me in the chat? That's right. Morgan said it. Debt. Debt will destroy everybody going into this. Number one, this is going to be like nothing else we've ever seen because this is the end of a long-term debt cycle. So right in the name of that spells the problem in that. Debt is not your friend. Now, I know there's good debt and there's bad debt. So we're going to dissect those two and really identify what makes debt good and what makes debt bad. But I want you to, from the surface right now just to assume all debt's bad, especially credit card debt, really bad. Your car loan debt, not so good. Your boat loan, not so good. Any depreciating asset, okay, that you have debt on is what we really want to focus on. Now, the clock's ticking because obviously you're already seeing the markets melting down. I, I don't even know what the hell is going on uh, in the markets today, but it's just like every day there's the markets are up, down, up, down, up 1,000 points one day, down 500 the next, then down 300, then up 50, then down 100. How, how many of you love that? Well, there's going to be a lot more of that happening. I mean, just because we're in the, the fourth quarter right now, that's the only reason the markets are really staying up and manipulation and a whole bunch of other crap that we don't need to get into. But what we do need to get into is paying off debt. And the best way to do that, the way that you can do that, no matter where you're at in your financial situation, because we really, really have to not just hit this from people that have lots of money, but we need to hit this from the people that that don't have a lot of money because it doesn't matter whether you have money or you don't have money, your money is going somewhere. I mean, unless you're just a bum and you don't work and you're just, you know, waiting for the government to mail you another check, then I don't think, no, actually we don't have any of those people on this webinar. So we can just discount those because they're not really trying to get ahead. They're just, you know, trying to have somebody else take care of everything for them, which I know is none of you. So let's get into the, the number one best way to build wealth. Stephen, what's the best way to build wealth that you know of? I would uh, say real estate. Okay, real estate. How about everybody else? Let, let's have everybody else you know, chime in. What's the best way you can think of to build wealth? Own other debt, build, sell your own business. Okay, real estate, whole life policy, take loans, fund businesses, lending money. Is that it? Is everybody, that's everybody's way to, to build wealth? That's your best shot at building wealth? Okay, buy whole life policies. Guys are just being nice. Private money club. <laughs> All right, hold on. L let's go to, to Morgan. Let's just pimp. I like that, John. Okay, you can become a pimp. Uh, let, let's talk about Morgan right here. Get out of debt. Get rid of debt. But why would that be, Morgan, why would that be a way to build wealth? Velocity of money through businesses, renting out crypto. We got a whole bunch of people with some pretty exotic stuff going on here, followed by estate and then infinite banking. There we go. More, so Morgan was really the only one there that got it right. Every one of you were right in what you said. There was nobody that was wrong in what you said at all. But really, it does come down to just a very simple two-part equation here. And let's just do it by drawing a line down the middle. And this is what you all know as a budget. One side, you got your income. Some of you have W-2. Others have 1099. I mean, some of you are pimping. So you got pimp income, you know, which is probably just cash. So you're not getting a 1099 there. So we'll just call pimp money, non-disclosed money, which I really don't want to know too much about. And then over on this side, we've got expenses and debt. 
All right. So if you follow Dave Ramsey, Dave Ramsey would have you go through and write down all your expenses, right? You got, you got diapers, you got groceries, you know, so he'd tell you to shop at Aldi. Uh, Dave Ramsey would say cut out Starbucks, but some of you actually probably have like a Starbucks budget and all your other things, rent, so on and so forth. So Dave Ramsey's way of doing this a lot of times really is just, well, let's cut out the excess. You know, let's just put Netflix subscription and, you know, subscriptions and that. He says, okay, start making your own coffee. Get rid of the, the things you don't need. And right, that all works. But every time you get rid of something that you love, you're starting to chip away at, you know, your sanity and your happiness. We can give up so much of our life just to find this happiness. But once we get to that point, are you really happy? You gave up all the things that you loved, you know, maybe you, whatever they are. These are your expenses. So you could do that, but let's just pretend that we don't, we really don't want to give up the things that we love. And I agree with you. So then the next place would be, we're going to look at your debts. There's probably very few of you on here that have no debts. Okay. Maybe, uh, you know, someone just said, uh, can I be a 76 year old pimp? Now, maybe RCT and a bunch of numbers doesn't have any debt, but th that'd be rare. And all of you are going to have debts. And I, I would urge you to put them in order from you know the worst debts, which would be credit cards, lines of credit, car loans. You got you got them all. Uh, you know, boat loans, furniture loans. I mean, there, there's all these different things. So you got all these debts. Credit cards, whatever that balance is, requires or is every one of these is costing you a monthly income. So over here, the expenses, you can cut things off, but let's just assume that these up here are not going to change. So your expenses, we're not going to change any of those. What we're going to change is who gets the money that's paid on your debts. You got balances on credit cards. You got balances on all these. And we could kind of just make it up. But each one of those balances comes with an interest rate because the payment that you're making, let's call that this, your monthly payment you're making is a combination of the interest charge plus principal repayment. How much is that interest? Well, if we were to then just kind of eliminate some of this, credit cards on average are about 20%. And I don't know, how much are all of you paying on your credit card debts? I just want to get kind of just an average. No, no, not, not, not interest. I'm sorry, monthly payments, monthly payments. We'll get to interest in a second. No, no, just give me like how much a month dollar amount. There you go. Deborah, 150 to 250, 100 bucks. 300. I'm just trying to kind of gauge an average here. 101. Pay every bill off. All right. So Mike's the rare one. So some people are 800, some people are 100, but let's just say 300. Now, how about let's just keep going. Lines of credit. How much are you paying on your lines of credit every month? And, and I don't want the line of credit that you're lending through Private Money Club, but like the line of credit that you use to buy the furniture and all the stuff you shouldn't have used it for. How much per month is your line of credit costing you? Okay. 300. And I don't want to waste a lot of time with this. We're kind of bouncing around, but let's just say 300 here for the lines of credit. And let's say, I don't know, 7%. Car loans, what's, what's your car loan? How much are you paying for your car loan? 290, 450, 630, 400. All right, let's go 400 bucks. I just saw a couple of those. Anyone got any boats? Any other like things? Steven, what do you, you got a boat? You got a loan on that thing? No. Steven's been around the campfire a little bit too long. So, but you know, if you got a, how much would a boat loan cost? Maybe a thousand bucks. A thousand bucks. So maybe you got a boat loan. And I'm just making stuff up here, folks. Okay. But as you can see, each one of these, these checks that you're writing are going to someone else's bank. And that's, let's see, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we got two thousand bucks, I think, if I did my math correct. That's two thousand dollars every single month that's going away to somebody else. And then you got your W-2, your 1099, and your pimp money is what is being used. And hopefully some of you, after you're done with that, you have money that then goes into savings, which would be after you're done taking all your income, subtracting out all your expenses, subtracting out all your debt payments, the balance is going to savings. And obviously we already know that savings should you change one thing and put it into you know, your own policy. We'll just write IBC, but not getting there. So right now, if I were to look at an equation like this, if I took any one of you and I sat down with you or any of our money mentors sat down with you and did a call, we would identify how much money you're giving away. And then what we would do is put it in an order, okay? We would put it in order from lowest balance to highest balance. Forget about interest rate, just lowest balance to highest balance. So let me kind of show you what that would look like. Let's go to the next page now that you're understanding this. 
So let's just say your lowest balance is a credit card. You owe $1,000 on that credit card. That credit card is costing you 20% and you're making minimum monthly payments of $40 a month. And then your next one is another credit card and that one's 2,010% and you're trying to pay the minimum on that. You know, we, and we do basically just kind of keep putting them in order Then maybe a car loan. You got a couple cars in the family. One, you only owe five grand on 0% interest. And, you know, I don't know, let's call that 250 bucks a month. Then you got car two, that one you owe 40 grand on. That one's 3% interest and you're paying 700 bucks a month for that. You get the drift, lowest to highest. <clears throat> what we would then do is we would identify how much money you're saving on a monthly basis. Now I know the IBC concept, you know, and, and that's gonna be the ideal place for the money to go, which I'll get to in a second as to why, but let's just keep it simple. You got your money after you spend, you make all your money and you spend all your money. The difference is how much money per month you save. Just wanna show you where this goes. So over here, I'm just gonna write your monthly savings. And hopefully your monthly savings isn't zero because this isn't gonna work so well if it's zero from the surface. I'll show you, we'll go another round. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that monthly savings. Now let's just say that's a thousand bucks a month that you're saving. In one month's time, I have, I have saved a thousand dollars. So the very first thing I would want to make sure that I had before doing anything else is I would want, want to at least have four to six months of expenses. Let's just say that's 10 grand. Okay. So that's 10 months. So if you got, if you're starting from scratch and you had a thousand dollars a month times 10 months, that's what it would take to get you your emergency fund. So that would kind of be a hindrance, but that would be the first step. Now let's just assume that you've already got your emergency fund. So the first thing, month one, $1,000 that you have to save. How we would have you do that is we would have that money pay off this credit card. That means now $40 a month is now freed up. So we're plus 40. That $40 is going to come back and start replenishing the 1000 that went out. Then it's going to take two months for us to then pay the second one off. So two months, we pay this one off. Now we're plus 50. Now you can see there's one thing here that has to happen for this to work. You have to be, you have to actually do this. And I don't mean pay the credit card off, but you have to do two things. When you pay the credit card off, you got to make sure it stays paid off. Don't go racking that credit card back up. We're trying to get you ahead, not behind. So once this credit card is paid off, either find a way to make sure that it stays paid off or just don't even use it. And then the second thing you got to do is take the money that you were giving away and you got to put that money back where it came from. Now, a lot of people are not conditioned enough to actually let money sit in a savings account and build up. Like they find a million things that happen. Oh, this happened. Oh, that happened. So what I would suggest doing is not put the money in a regular savings. I would suggest going to a different bank. So go to a community bank in your town. And what I want you to do is open a checking account, but don't get a debit card and don't order any checks. Literally, you got to make this like super hard to get this money. I'm trying to like close the door, if you will. So you're going to open a checking account, but you're not going to get any checks and you're not going to tell them, don't give me any of those temporary checks and don't give me a debit card. Then what you're going to do is when you pay off these credit cards, the 40 and the 50, you're going to literally set up a bill pay or a transfer so that that 40 and $50 every month is going into this account. This account, in order to get this money out, you physically have to go in the bank and get it or online banking, but we don't want it to be as hard as possible. And then all we're doing now is this is now building. So now you got almost a hundred bucks. You got $90 every single month going into this new account. Okay. So this is account number two, and this is account number one. So now you got a thousand a month plus 90 bucks a month. Over time, we get enough money saved up and you pay the car off. So then what we do every time you pay a loan off, that loan replenishes this account. So now we got 250 going in here and then you pay loan car off too. And that's, this takes time. That's the problem. But all I just did here is I literally just showed you a way, what was that, 700? A way to then build wealth through your own debts and expenses. Because if we can get rid of your debts and we can recapture the money you're giving away, you are building wealth through the debts that you used to have just by doing what the bank did every single day to you. You just took back that responsibility. So you took back the banking functions in your life. And now you've got this little slush fund of money going here because now all your debts are paid off 
And then you got this money still building up in this check in this bank account. Plus you got the money still building up in this account. Now what we need to do is take the next step and figure out where that money can go to work for you smarter. This is this isn't very complicated, right? How many of you are actually doing this right now? You're actively saving money. And when you save up enough, you're paying down debts and you're recapturing the money. How many of you are actually doing this right now? Give it to me in the chat. So Ray's going to start. Come on, who else? Bill, about to start. How come everybody's about to start? How come everybody hasn't started? Hold on. Somebody just had some numbers in there. If we continue to make those payments, we are gaining 1040 per month. Yeah, I didn't do the math, but thank you. 1040 a month in this example. I mean, and this is going to be different. I mean, how many of you would like 1040 extra dollars? I do it. So great. Never thought of any of this. Uh, and a lot of people just say that, you know, I've just never thought about doing this. But this is this is this basic fundamental thing. Now, the other thing I want you to all realize is some of you are thinking, well, that's great. You only owed a thousand dollars, but maybe you're the person that every one of your credit cards has an extra zero behind it. And you're like, well, that would take a long time. I can only save a thousand. My smallest balance is 10 grand. Perfect. So you want to see how that works? Erase everything that we just did. Now, you got a thousand you're saving, your lowest credit card's 10,000. Credit cards are cool because if we pay this credit card down every month, so if we so if we had one credit card and it was 10,000 bucks and you're like, "Well, that's great, but you know, that model that you just drew out there doesn't apply to me because I, I can only save a little bit and I can't pay the credit card off. It's going to take me a long time." But what you could do is every month of this savings you could chip this thing down. You could subtract a thousand bucks. So now your balance is only 9,000. Your monthly payment that you're making on a 10,000 would be slightly more. Let's say it was two, it was 200 before, but we just paid 10,000 down to a thousand dollars. So now your monthly payment might not be 200 minimum anymore. Now maybe it's 175. And, and folks, all you got to do is in, in a one month cycle, you can figure this out. You could even call the credit card company and you could ask them, if I pay the balance down by $1,000, what would my minimum payment be? I think they can probably tell you that. But whatever you saved here, so what did we save? 200 minus 175 is you just saved $25. So now your recapture is just the amount that you saved. You didn't pay the card off, but you paid it down. By paying it down, your monthly minimum payment reduced. We do this all the time. A lot of people don't think of this. The fact that they never thought about the other thing, like, well, okay, now you know about it, but a lot of people don't think about this. Credit cards and lines of credit that are simple interest, when you pay principal down, your monthly payment goes down, which gives you an amount to recapture. Although it might be small, that's 25 bucks you didn't have the month before. And every month you do the same thing, thousand. Now, again, you gotta be conditioned. You can't keep racking this card up. So then it goes down to a buck 50. So then we recapture another 25. And then every month you're doing this, a thousand bucks. And then every month it's going down, okay? You're recapturing every single month. So you can, you can see how this is working, right? 8,000 minus a thousand. Every month you're knocking it down, but every month you're also knocking the minimum payment down. You have to be conditioned enough to do this. You have to get in the habit of doing this. I'll never forget when I, you know, when I first started the infinite banking concept, I started doing this. I had lots of credit cards, lots of them. And I was paying a ton of money out. And I remember I didn't have a lot that could go into my first policy. I think, you know, the first time I started this, my amount that was going into my policy was like 560 some bucks a month. My first policy ever was 230, but that was a long time ago. Like when I started using them, there was like 500 and change that was going into that policy. That doesn't build up very quick. But what I did is every single quarter, I didn't do it monthly, but every single quarter, I would basically save so that you know every quarter I put a thousand dollars a month in, and then every single quarter, let's just say it was three grand, I would take that out and I would deploy that money. So that's how I did. It. I did it quarterly because doing it monthly is quite a bit of work, but I had it all on a spreadsheet. I had it all on a spreadsheet. So every quarter it prompted me, and I put that spreadsheet right next to my computer screen. So every day I'd look at it, and then when the month came up, oh, December crap, I got to. I got to do that. And then I would just do it and I would pay the things down. And eventually I was out of debt and all that money that I used to give away that we just did, which, you know, in that last example was a thousand forty. All that money was then my money. And I'll never, I mean, listen, like to this day, this is going way back to this day. 
the amount of those original credit cards and those original lines of credit that I paid off, I still recaptured that money. Some of you wouldn't do that. Some of you would be like, well, why would you do that? You would have long paid off that credit card. I do it because I've built a habit of saving it. I used to give it away. Then I recaptured it, but I never tracked how long it would have taken me to pay the loan off because I just built the habit of continually making that payment. But the coolest part is that payment that I got in the habit of making, that went back to me. Except for all of this stuff, all the payments that I made did not go into a savings or a checking account, folks. All the payments that I made in my equation that I just gave, the money didn't start in a savings account. The money started in a policy. So instead of putting $1,000 a month in a savings account, that money started in a specially designed and engineered whole life policy. Why? Well, because I didn't like what the savings account was paying me in interest. I mean, back a long time ago when I first started this, I think it was like three to 4%. We were getting into savings, but the policies were like 6.5% back then with dividends. They're not that anymore. They're between five to six right now. But still, right now, you're not getting three to four in your savings. You're getting 1% or less. So it just made mathematical, logical sense, right? Doesn't that make logical sense, folks? If you're getting less than 1% in a savings account, or we'll just call it 1%. Anyone getting more than 1% right now? Anyone? 0.9, that's close. Ray's getting 0.9. Sophie is getting, uh, or SOFI, I think is the bank, 3.25, credit union 2.08. So on credit unions and some of the online banks, the rates are getting higher than the commercials, but those rates aren't guaranteed. You know, 3.25 is the highest that we've got. That's the highest I've actually heard of. And, and we do this training every single week and we ask every week. But still, whether it's one or 3.25%, is five to six more than one? Yes. Is five to six more than 3.25? Yeah. And also too, when a bank pays you interest between one and 3.25, at the end of the year, do you have to pay tax on that interest? Yep. You get a 1099 INT. So that's really not an effective amount you're making. You're actually paying tax on that. Over here, the five to six net, you know, there's cost of insurance and everything, which I'm going to have Steven put it up on the screen, what the numbers could look like, but this is tax free. So all this money that's building, that including the dividend, whoops, it is tax deferred, but I'm just going to put, this is all tax free. So tax free at a higher rate is better than taxed at a lower rate. So for me, it just made sense. Let's change where my money went first. And then when the money went here, I already told you every quarter, I would take a loan from my policy. This is that, that new bank account. So we'll just call this your segregated bank account. Remember I showed bank number two. And then I would take that money and I would move it over here. And then I would move it over to pay off whatever the debts were. And this is, these are the credit cards, the car loan. I got cell, I mean, come on. Some of you have cell phone loans, cell loan. Okay, this is remodel loan. And this would be fitness loan. Because I know during the pandemic, some of you went out and bought treadmills. You bought Peloton bikes. You bought workout equipment for the basement or for the garage, right? And how did you buy all that stuff? I bet you some of you financed it. Well, so does everybody else. So these are all your debt loads. And then all I did is as I paid things off quarterly, I just recaptured that money. I'd put it into this bank account. And then from there, I would just pay it back to my policy as a loan repayment. And then every single time, then I would just redeploy that money. And I would then pay off other things, cell phone loan. And then the cell phone. So let's say the credit cards were 100 a month. The cell phone loan, I don't know, 60 bucks. And then I actually remember that. I, I had a, a loan with, I think it was with Verizon or with Apple for one of my old cell phones. And when I looked at the statement, they were dinging me. I was like a little over 60 bucks a month. But I, I kept paying them $60 a month because that $60 a month I was paying them was 0% interest. How many of you can relate to that? Steven, your cell phone that you're typing on right now, is that finance or did you pay cash for that? Cash. Okay. So see, Steven's been around this campfire too long. It's, it's bad for me to ask him, but how many of you have a loan for the cell phone that you have with Apple or Samsung? Yeah. Zero percent. There we go. Yeah. It's easy to do. They kind of just build it right into your monthly payment. Like when you first get it. Absolutely. But a bunch of you do. You have loans for the cell phone and especially the new, the new Apple phone. How much is that new Apple phone, Stephen? Is like, oh, they're always like, Thousand fifteen hundred. I mean, yeah, yeah. Two two phones, two tablets, two uh, yeah watches. There you go. Eight hundred. You know, Dexter says eight hundred. But but we all justify that because it's a zero percent loan. 
and that's why we justify it. But does that change the fact that sixty to eight hundred dollars a month is going out the door? This sixty dollars or eight hundred dollars a month that you're making on all those gadgets, even though it's zero percent interest, that money is no longer in your bank account. To justify that, a lot of times what we have to do is we have to look at the spread. Here's how much I'm making. Here's how much money it costs me to use that money. And that's the spread we make in the policy. So let me just give it to you this way. Let's just say your policy paid you 5% and it cost you 4% to use the money. So you make five and it costs you four. What's your spread? 1%, right? So if you were making a spread of 1%, would it make sense to take money from your policy, pay off a 0% loan on a cell phone just to get the cash flow back? It would make sense all day long because you're making at least 1% and then you're taking back whatever that money is. I got it 60 bucks and you're recapturing that money back to the same place it came from and you're repaying the loan. So when you're repaying the loan, the spread just keeps getting better, but you're doing, you're repaying the loan, not with new money that you had to work harder for. It's just new money that you were giving away that now you get to keep. The other thing too about that is this is you're in full control. We're always, always, always talking about control, always talking about con who controls your money. In this narrative, when all these, the fitness loan for all that equipment, the remodel loan, the cell phone, the iPad, the, the watch, all those loans that you got 0% interest. Hey, we did this because they don't charge. Why would I have used my money? Because they charge 0%. But it still doesn't change the fact that each one of these is a monthly payment you're giving away to someone else. I don't care if it's 0%. Some of you have car loans that are 0%. Some of you have credit card loans that are 0%. But it doesn't matter. You don't control the money at the end of the month. The second you make that car payment, that $500 is gone from your family forever. So when you change the narrative of the control aspect, and you understand how this works by changing just where your money started first, you get to then benefit and profit year over year. Now, the first couple of years are inefficient. You know, Some of you are like, yeah, but... In the first couple of years, you're not, you're, you're, you're not making a spread. True. Very true. But just because you don't make money for... So let me put it this way. How many of you would be okay losing a little bit of money for three years to make money for the rest of your life? And you guys can figure out how many years that is for the rest of your life. Some of you are in your 80s and you're like, well, I don't know, man. It's kind of a trade-off. It could be tomorrow. But for most of you, like, think about that. You give up. You, you lose a little bit of money for three years so that you can guaranteed make money for the rest of your life. How many of you would make that trade-off? I would, I did. Stephen would, he did. Yes, the first couple of years sucks in these. It's, it's not for nothing. It's not like you don't have the money available. You just don't have all of it available. But that's only the first couple of years. Then once you make it through that and you hit your efficiency point, which we'll show you a policy design in a second, after that every year for, for the rest of your life, you're making money every single year for the rest of your life. You're making a spread. Can you imagine if that spread after three or four years or whatever your policy design is, you wouldn't care about, you could have 0% car loans. You could have 0% credit card loans, 0% fitness loans, 0% remodel loans. Like you might've nailed it on the interest rate. And, and if you did just know that that'll never happen again in your lifetime, but just saying, Hey, you had a good run because those days are gone of the 0%. But let's just pretend you did. If you were making a spread, you were beyond those couple of years, a spread of two, a spread of three, a spread of four, you would absolutely positively pay off all of these things, even if they were a 0% loan, because then you would get back control of the money instead of giving it away to somebody else. Does that make sense? But see, there's even a better way to do it. Over time, and let me let me get rid of this, over time, when you actually kind of get through that initial phase where it's not as efficient, let's see here. Yeah, uh, lending. I got to find a good chart here to show it. Here we go. We'll use this one. Now, let's assume some of you are a little bit further ahead. So now you've got some money saved up. So let's just, now let's just put, I'll just use round math. You paid off your debts or you've just been saving. You got a hundred grand. Okay. I don't care if it starts at a hundred grand in your savings account. So let's, let's do that. We've already determined, I don't care if your savings one to 3.25%, making five to six is still better and making five to six tax-free is still better. So 
it would make sense to take that 100 and change who holds that money and put it into your bank, specially designed and engineered whole life. But now instead of taking that money and paying off all those debts, even if you had debts in this scenario, what if you were like, yeah, but I got this amount of money. I could pay all my debts off today, but that just doesn't seem like the best way to do this. It might not be. Let's just say instead of doing that, we took that money. I don't say we took 90 grand and we were to lend that money out on private money club on a real estate deal or whatever investment you want. Maybe you're just going to buy. I'm just using things that are close to me. You're going to lend that money out and you're going to make a loan at 12%. What's the math on that? 90,000. Let's just do the math. 90 grand times 0.12. It's $10,800 a year. $10,800 a year divided by 12, $900 a month. So you had 90 grand. I, sh I can't believe I didn't just do that math in my head for the monthly. But anyway, 12%, that money's loaned out. Let's say it's loaned out for nine months. Well, actually, let's do 12 months just to keep it all nice and simple. 12% for 12 months. And now you got 900 bucks. So that $900 that's coming back into this segregated account, let's say you got debts. Now, let's say we take that $900 every month and we apply that to pay off those credit cards that are costing you 20% that you're giving away $100 a month to. So we take that $900 every month or every quarter and we start chopping away these credit cards. This $900 was a component of your money working for you. So that was almost like found money. Your money was working for you at a rate of $900 a month, which is a 12% loan. And now that $900 a month can work for you again by paying off your credit cards. And the whole time, depending on where you're at in your policy, you make a spread. So technically in this one, you're making money once, you're recapturing money here, which recapture is kind of the same as making money as you pay your debts off. And you're making money a third time, which is the spread. I just kind of start at the top here. Will we have access to this amazing presentation? Yeah, absolutely, Deborah. So what we do is we um, we edit it and we put it on the YouTube channel. So just go over to YouTube at the Chris Noggle and subscribe, and then we'll post this on there typically Monday or Tuesday the following week. And if you subscribe, it'll alert you when it gets posted. So thanks for asking. Will said, with the money in a bank savings account, you're taxed on the interest you earn. Do you pay tax on every dollar that comes through your savings account, or do they tax the money? That's in that account at the end of the year. I asked since W-2 income is deposited into a traditional bank account, then I can route it into a policy, but it is getting taxed just by existing in a bank account, even if for a short time. Um, I mean, you're taxed on the interest that if your bank savings account pays you interest, you're taxed on that. Uh, do you pay any tax on every dollar that comes through your savings account or do they tax money that's in the account at the end of the year? So they, they, they at the end of the year, the bank or the wherever your money is in a traditional sense, not the policies, but whatever interest you made on that money at the end of the year, they send you a 1099 INT, an interest. Or if you get dividends from your stocks, it's a 1099 DIV, right, dividend. So I ask since W-2 income is deposited into a traditional bank account, then I route it into the policy, but it is getting taxed just by existing in the bank. Well, no, yeah, but- yeah, checking I, accounts don't pay interest anyways. I yeah, mean, you're using checkings, not savings. Right. So I, I was talking about like long-term people keeping money in a savings account. Checking accounts, I don't know any that pay any kind of interest. So you're not really, there's no other way. First off, there's no other way to do it. We still have to utilize the mechanism of a, a save or a checking account to move the money through, which is why every you know diagram we have has a bank account, the segregated bank account in the middle, because the money's got to go from the policy to a bank account to wherever it's going. There's there's really no other way to do it. I suppose you could have the policy send a wire directly to, but then you don't have books and records. So I wouldn't do that. So is it common for a private lender to ask for points or fees in addition to the 12%? Yeah. If you don't have a relationship with them, it is. Yeah. A lot of them do that. Yeah, definitely points are are nothing new. Some lenders do charge points, some don't. If I've got a relationship with a particular borrower and I'm lending to them, I don't charge points because I've got the relationship. But if there's someone brand new and I just feel like there's maybe a little risk or I'm just sometimes maybe I just want to make a little more, I, I, I might add points. I haven't done that in a long time, but you're just saying, you know, it's not uncommon to do that.
Yeah. So James, that's an interesting thing that you just said here. So James was saying in theory, he's talking about the interest, you know, that you got to pay tax on in theory, but your private money, it would be a private money borrower may not declare, oh, the lender might not declare the income. Yeah. Remember that would be that pimpin money. So remember we talked about the pimp money. There's some people out there that aren't doing this the right way because they're not declaring the money, even though they should. And then there's some borrowers that aren't sending 1099s out. Shame on them. But if, if you're a borrower and you're paying a lender income, okay, in, in the form of interest checks every month, at the end of the year, your CPA or your bookkeeper or somebody, or even you, needs to send a 1099 for the interest that you paid them. I mean, otherwise, like you could be at fault for that. But I'm not going to get into tax advice or anything. You know, talk to your tax consultant or your CPA for that. So there we go. Bill charges uh, points to cover his cost for lending the money. So how I do it is if I'm lending money, whoever I'm lending the money to, I make them pay my attorney. So whatever my attorney's fees are, my, I, my attorney already knows it. So I don't even need to tell them any of your costs, Mr. Valone, I want the borrower to pay those. So before the deal closes in the closing statement, all of my costs, you know, as Bill's talking about, all of my costs for that loan, which would be the note and, you know, the review of any documents or anything, I put all that over there on, on them in the closing statement. I just, I just don't charge points. I just make them pay all my expenses. So that's how I do it. There's no one way to do it. Let's see, Rob, is it wise to start IBC while saving, hopefully for a house thinking need the liquid cash? So Rob, if you're, if you're, primary thing you're saving for right now is a house and you're going to buy a house in the next year or two years, then no, I would continue just saving for the house in a savings account. Just because like I said, in the first couple of years, it's inefficient. So we have had a lot of people say that where they're like buying a house, like a lot of times they're like, oh, we're going to be buying a house in the next year. Should we put the money in the policy first and then buy the house? In the long run, that would work out and make sense. But just as a general webinar kind of training, I would say, no, just continue saving it in just a traditional savings account because then you'll have full liquidity and you won't give up any of that inefficiency in those first couple of years. So hopefully that helps, Rob. Steven, would you agree with that? Or you can kind of make a case both ways. Yeah, no, nothing to add to that. Two points in the front end or at the final sale. Uh, points are typically on the front end of the loan. So when the deal is funded, like a lender is going to lend money to a borrower, uh, when that deal closes, in the closing statement are the points. Uh, and banks charge points too. I don't know if any of you have ever noticed. Uh, they just don't call it points. Usually points, banks almost always front load a loan. They charge fees and processing fees and everything. It's the same thing as points. It's just in the private lending or hard money lending world, they just call it points. And in the banking world, it's just fee after fee after fee after fee after fee. Yeah? Anyone ever actually read your closing statement? And see how many fees you paid in closing costs. The average mortgage that I do through a local community bank, the average loan, which are relatively small, $150,000 to $300,000 loans, they cost us like $5,000. Not all of those are going to the attorney. I mean, some of them are appraisal fees and stuff like that. But, you know, an attorney fees, let's just say an appraisal and an attorney on a high side is $1,500. Five grand minus 1500 yeah, the rest is all bank fees. So just because you go through a bank to get finance, maybe some of you are like, oh, I'm going to borrow from a bank because I don't want to pay points. You're still paying points. You're just, they're just not calling it points. They're, just, they're, they're loading up all the fees. Banks are going to always cost you more than, a, than most hard money or private money lenders are from a, from a cost standpoint. For me to be able to place the money into the policy, make the premium payments, do a potential cash dump, and then recapture the money as I pay it. The big thing that stands out to me is that the person has to already have a pre pretty sizable income just to do that at a basic level. Feels like a situation where you need to already be rich in order to get rich. I know uh, simplification. So you're overcomplicating it, Sam. You, you really are. You're, you're, you're making it overcomplicated. I don't think you need to be rich to do what we just said. You're already making your monthly expenses, right? So let's let's go back. You've already got income, right, Sam? You're already making your you're already paying your expenses and you're already paying your debts, correct? So what's the what's the differentiating equation in doing IBC? This, right? It's your savings. That's it. So if you're not able to save money, then no, this won't work. 
You know, if you're somebody that every dollar you're making, including your pimp and money, is going out the door, then of course this isn't the IBC concept is not going to work because you're living paycheck to paycheck. Then I hate to tell you, but there's this guy, Dave Ramsey, that you should maybe talk to that's going to tell you not to drink Starbucks, get rid of Netflix, get rid of all those extra subscriptions, stop getting groceries at Wegmans and start going to and Wegmans is a, a kind of really nice grocery store, probably the best in the country. Go to uh, I don't know, the Dollar General or go, yeah, you get the drift. So Instead of buying cloth diapers, buy those plastic cheap ones. You know, he's going to tell you to cut things. So I don't really have an answer for you. But yes, you do have to be saving money in order to make this work. There's, there's no free lunch. I mean, maybe resellers, you know, if you're already doing the resellers program, I mean, that helps people at a tune of 750 bucks a month. Uh, check that video out or get a hold of them and see if they can help you out. And then Mark said, I already have a HELOC. I owe 40 grand on my first mortgage and 40 grand in credit card debt. Should I pay the $40,000 mortgage first or the credit card debt? Uh, Mark, good question. So that's that's a mathematical equation. So what, what he's saying here is he's got a $40,000 first mortgage. Is that on your house? So let me make sure I read that right. 40,000 first mortgage. And then, for, I mean, this is an easy one. And then 40,000 in credit cards. So your first mortgage, what is your rate? Well, I mean, let me just make it up. Let's just go high and say it's five. Okay, so let's just say you're paying $40,000 first mortgage. I'm assuming that's your primary residence. And let's say it's 5% five, 5 and let's just say your payment's 1,200 bucks a month. And then over here, you got $40,000 in credit card debt. They're probably charging you more like 20%. I don't really know, but 40,000, what is 40,000 in credit card debt? It's gotta be about 1,200 bucks, right? Even let's just say it's less. Let's say it's 800 bucks a month. Oh, that's the minimum. Which one would you pay off? Would you pay the mortgage off at 5%, $1,200 a month? Or would you pay the $40,000 credit card off that's 20%? And this is simple interest that is a lower monthly payment. So the minimum might be lower than your mortgage. Hell, I mean, let's, let's make this even a bigger spread. $1,500 monthly payment on the mortgage and $800 on the credit card. So if you were just focused on the monthly amount, you'd think, all right, well, I'm gonna pay the mortgage off. But that was, that'd was that probably be the wrong decision because over here, you're never gonna get ahead. At least over here, every payment, some of this is going to principal and chances are at 800 on 40 grand, none of this is going to, to principal. So absolutely pay off the credit card, take the $800 a month that you used to give you know, to the credit card, pay that 800 as an extra principal payment on the mortgage. And I'm just keeping this stuff super high level. So a lot of you right now have equity in your house, or maybe you got a 401k. So let's hit them both, but I'll do them separate. So let's just assume some of you have a house, you got equity, money that's sitting lazy in your rafters. Okay. So you got equity in your house to get that equity out the most common way. And we know of a couple other ways, but let's just keep it simple as a home equity line of credit. Home equity lines of credit right now are probably 7% interest, okay? So you got 7% interest to get the money out of a HELOC. So what was being said is, should I take, and uh, let's put a monetary value on it. Should I take the 50,000 in equity that I have in my house, put it into a policy, just call this a whole life, put it into a policy and then move that money out to do everything else, okay? Would that be the smart thing? Yeah, that's not a bad idea to do that. But I would almost argue that the one reason I wouldn't maybe do it that way is just because if you're making five to six here and this is costing you seven, you've got, you got an inefficiency. And again, I'm keeping this stuff really high level. This might not be the actual returns. I'm just face value, okay, full disclaimer. So I don't like that. So what I would suggest and how I would do it is I would take the 50 grand, if you're comfortable with this, Deborah, and I would lend that money out. Well, I'm just going to pick on PMC on a real estate deal. I'd find a real estate deal on there that I could lend that money out at 12%. Then what I would do is I would take whatever interest is paid out of that 50. So let's say it was uh, 500 bucks, I believe. I would take the 500. Let's say this $50,000 home equity line of credit cost me 250. And I would take 250 of the 500. I would pay that down on the HELOC. And then I would take the other 250. And I would then put $250 a month or whatever into the whole life. That's how I would do it. 
because now my money is actually working for me at a positive spread. So you can see the spread at 12 minus seven, you're making a spread. You could even just say, all right, well, I'm just going to not do that until I have more money. And I'm going to take the full 500 and I'm going to pay the full 500 down on the home equity line. You're still making a spread. The name of the game in banking is spread. It's what you always want to be focused on. Can I make a spread? And does the risk outweigh the reward? Or is the reward outweigh the risk? Does the return outweigh the risk? You got to always look at it from risk reward. So that would be equity. Two different plays you could do. Could you take the equity, put it directly in the policy? Yes. And then you could take maybe 40 of that out and lend that out on PMC. That's another option. So again, there's not one best way, but I just always want you to be thinking of the spread. This is how I would probably do it. But another one is 401ks. 401k. How's your 401k doing right now? Yeah, it probably looks a lot like that, right? Actually, it doesn't look like that. Sorry. It looks like this. But if we wanted to really figure out where the direction of it is, that's down, right? Just want to make sure I got this right. So if your 401k is going down and you haven't reallocated it, the one thing you can do is you can take a loan, 50,000 or 50%. So whatever your balance is, let's just use this 50 grand because that's why I use 50 grand on the equity. So if you got a loan, if you got a 401k and you can take a loan for 50 grand, how would you do that? Well, a couple of things. There's a, and we teach this in other ones. I'm just going to hit it real high level. If we could take the loan. They're going to charge interest. Let's just say the interest is 6%. doesn't matter what the interest is that they charge you long as you've got the cash flow to pay the loan back because the interest goes back to your 401k. So whatever the interest is on the loan on the 401k, the only problem that creates for you is it's just a cash flow problem. You have to, on a per pay period, you have to pay that money back uh, over whatever duration. Let's call it a five-year loan. Okay, so five-year, 6% loan. It doesn't matter because all the money goes back into your 401k. So it's literally like a guaranteed 6% return. How many of you would love to get a guaranteed return of 6% on your 401k right now, all of you, right? So just take a loan from your 401k and pay it back out of the payroll. But if we're gonna have to pay back six, even though it's going into your account, wouldn't it make sense to make that 50 go to work? So let's do three scenarios of three different ways you could do this. Option number one, you could go direct to make that money go to work. I, I keep picking on private money club just because it's easy for me to justify because it's what I do, 12%. Then you take the money from private money clubs return and you pay the loan back. Option number one. Let's say you got debt and you want to do what we showed on the first one. You want to pay debt off. So let's just use debt. So you take the 50 grand, you pay off the debt. Let's say the debt was, I don't know, $800 a month that you paid off with 50 grand. You take that and you pay that back to the 401k every month. Now that worked really well. Now you're out of debt. Okay, you've got $800 that you used to give away that you're now paying back to your 401k and you're making 6% plus whatever the, the I don't know, average return was that you were giving away. I did an example before it was 14%. Option number two. Option number three, and we've done lots of this, is take it, put it into the policy, then take the loan from the policy, pay the debt off, take the loan from the policy and lend it out. All three of these options, the reason I'm giving you guys three options, guys and gals, three options is there's not one that's right. They're all far better than what you're doing now. This always, putting the money into the policy first is always going to yield you the best return in the long run. But in the short run, it's going to be the, the hardest one to justify. So if you're trying to justify it three to five years, this isn't going to pencil. This will, this will, this will not pencil three to five. But again, earlier I asked all of you, would you be willing to give, you know, have a small loss for three years to gain money for the rest of your life? If you were the person that said, yes, I'd be willing to give that up, then this is always going to be your best option. So, okay. So Deborah says, I have 500,000 in equity not being used. Husband's reluctant to get a HELOC. Oh, I, we got to answer this one, Stephen. <laughs> let, let me just reverse the roles, Deborah. Let's just say, you know, I have a house with my wife. And we have $500,000 in equity in the house. And my wife was reluctant to get a home equity line of credit. First thing I'd ask is, you know, sweetie, why are you reluctant? Well, I don't want any more debt. I, you know, the, the number of reasons would come up. Deborah, I'm sure your husband has his own reasons, but I'd get those reasons out. And then what I would do is solve those problems. I would say, okay, 
you know, my, my wife's name's Larissa. I'd say, okay, Larissa, so let's just assume that everything continues as it is with the markets. Let's just say in a year from now, that $500,000 in equity that we have available today, let's just say that that's gone. And then her rebuttal would be like, that's not going to happen. Okay, well, let's just say instead of 500000 now it's only 250000 because our house goes down and we lose the equity. Well, that's not going to happen. Okay, well, let's just say that five hundred is now 400000 Okay, well, maybe. Do you want to give up $100,000? So Jim across the street asked me for hundred grand. He probably will never pay it back. Can I give, it to, can I give him hundred grand? Her answer is going to be no, right? Well, then why wouldn't you want me to get a home equity line of credit if, if I know for a fact that that money next year is going to be a lower amount than it is this year. Okay. The second thing I would identify is I would say, okay, what are the negatives for taking a home equity line of credit? Okay. Number one, there's only really one and that getting access to the 500,000 would hit your credit score. They're going to pull your credit. So maybe five to 10 points on your credit score temporarily. So if that's not worth $500,000, well, we're going to have a different discussion. No date night for her anymore. All right. You got to really kind of weigh out the good and the bad. But literally, I think you need to really think of two different things. We're going into a recession. There's no way around that right now. No way. We're already in a recession, just for the record. But, you know, they changed the rules for them. Uh, as, as our gentleman this morning told us, they're changing the rules for them. So they're, next year, the price of your house will be worth less. That's almost a fact which means your home equity line of credit, the equity you have in your house, you'll have less. But the more severe thing is really the realistic one. If we go into a recession, a deep one, chances are banks are gonna freeze lines of credit. They're not gonna offer lines of credit. They're not gonna wanna give, why would a bank wanna give you a line of credit on your house knowing that we're in a recession that the value of housing is going down or they, they didn't do it in 08, so why are they gonna do it this time? They didn't even do it during the pandemic. Wells Fargo froze all lines of credit during the pandemic. Like they, they stopped giving lines of credit out. It was headline news. We did, we did a show on that. So Deborah, like those are the realities that you need to get your husband to really see the light on because I, don't, I can't logically understand why anyone would not want to get a home equity line. I'm not saying you got to use it, but why would you not want to at least get access to the amount of money today? And then just be careful because they can reduce that. Matthew said, I have a HELOC at 3.99% based on current spreads of 12% loans, it makes sense to do a IBP and then loan on PMC. So I'm not really sure what, maybe IBC, maybe it was a typo, makes sense to do IBC then loan on PMC. How long do you see the 12 to 15% lasting based on the Fed? The 12 to 15% that some of the loans are on uh, I don't I don't have private money club up on my computer to show, but here, I'll pull it up real quick. So it has nothing to do with the Fed. All right, so here's deals. Fifth, sorry, interest calculator. 15%, 12%, they spelled that wrong. 12%, uh, this one I'd have to review. That one I'd have to review. But you know, if we just look at the deals, so the rates being charged on these or being paid on these deals has nothing to do so much with the Fed. It just has to be, do with the deal and how much this particular borrower is willing to pay on that deal and how much this borrower is willing to pay on that deal. And you can go through them all and you can see here's, here's one at 10%, 12, 10. You know, so they're all going to be different. But when you look at them, 12, 12, 12, they're all going to be different. But that, that isn't because of the, the Fed. That's just... That's just what people are willing to pay to get money to do the deal. Because people that have a deal, they're willing to pay a higher interest rate because they've already run the numbers. Their deal can support that rate of return. So that, that would be probably the best way to look at that. Uh, Belinda, can you do the same thing with self-directed IRAs? Take No. So good question, Belinda. So remember this 401k example? You cannot do this with an IRA. So if we change this from 401k to IRA of any type, no bueno, that doesn't work. So if you were trying to do self-directed, you would have to do a solo K, which is just like a 401k, but you got to be the sole member of the company. So a solo K, you can do this, but in an IRA, you cannot. So it, it's only going to work. And the reason for that is, is simple. An IRA isn't a component of an employer or isn't a component of a company-sponsored retirement plan. So therefore, when 
when the 401k loans or the solo K loans are, are allowed, that's because they know, forget about all this stuff, they know that there's a payroll. There's some type of a paycheck. Maybe not in the solo K, but they're assuming. So when they're allowing you to take a loan, there's something that they know has to happen. And that is you're getting a paycheck. The loans are only available for 401ks that you currently work at the company. Because the paycheck, what they're going to do is they're going to put a line item on there, loan, 401k loan repay. And every pay period, that money is going to be paid back. And then the balance is going to go to you. And you know we'll just draw that because your paycheck's probably never enough anyway. So the reason they allow loans is because you have a paycheck, which they then can put a line item repaying that money. Does that make sense? So that's why they don't let you take loans from self-directed IRAs or IRAs. Chris G, please address the fears. If the economy is going to crash and burn, that will not happen to us, but the person I'm lending to. How do I protect myself from that? The house rehabs aren't going to sell at the evaluations of today, uh, if at all. Then notice comes that their world is crashing, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so you're basically just talking, how do I, how do I assess the risks? All right, this is this is a good question. So what this person is essentially asking is, given that the markets are going to go down and we're going to be in a recession, everything's going to. I mean, if this is where we're going, guess what? It's not just stocks, right? It's not just the stock market that goes down. It's also going to be real estate. You're already seeing cars go down. I mean, Carvana is more than likely going to go bankrupt, and that's because they built a a model for used cars that was great when everybody wanted to use cars, but not so great in a rising interest rate market. So all these things are going down. So if you lend money on a real estate deal that had a valuation of, let's just say 300,000, and now the, the real estate valuation is no longer 300, now it's only 200, but every bit of the loan was based on a $300,000 valuation, you didn't factor in any kind of, you know, any kind of capitulation in the market. So when I lend, how I do it is if, you know, there's a deal on there right now, I'll just, I'll just use a real deal. <clears throat> I'll show you how I'd look at this. And folks, you know, you want to, you want to do your own due diligence on these, but let's just pick on this one because I've been working on this particular deal. All right. So this deal, 12%, 425. Let's say I want to lend at this. So let's just see what he's saying is potentially worth. Uh, financials. There we go. So after rehab value, 710,000, okay? So we got that, right? So let's use this particular deal because this is a real deal on private money club. So $710, let's get all the numbers on the board. This is his after rehab value, all right? Then he's buying it for 425 and I'll, I'll show my screen in a second. I'm just getting all the info I need and estimated repairs, 60,000. 60,300, you know, I'd have to ask him what he's planning on doing, but if I look at the photos, carpet paint, maybe either paint the vanity and do new countertops or or just leave it, I guess it's not terrible. Definitely, I mean, so we're going to need carpet and paint. That kitchen, I probably depending on if this is going to be a flip, if it's going to be a flip, I'd have to replace them all. But if it's not going to be a flip, you could take all these handles off, you could refinish all these. So I'd want to know his plan put new appliances in, new countertops for sure. I mean, can we please get rid of the curtains? And you could just pop this little balance piece off and you could just rip that straight so that it looks better. And you could repaint all these white. So then you'd have white built-ins. You could put nice black handles, like black bar poles and save some money. Uh, that looks like one of those 1990 sticky floors. So that's gotta go. So right out of the hole, let's see, we got three beds four baths, four bedrooms. And he's saying he's going to, now he's an experienced investor, but he's saying he's going to be able to do this for 30. So Chris, the first thing I'm going to do is call his bluff. 60. You're not remodeling. What's that, Steven? 60,000. Yeah, I know. So do you think he's going to be able to remodel this house for 60,000 bucks, Steven? It's a 3,900 square foot house. So let's say he's going to do all new flooring, paint all the walls, redo the kitchen cabinets and the vanity. He's got four bathrooms, four plus bathrooms. I mean, I've done enough renovations to say, Bobby, like, I like you, but I don't think you're going to be able to get this done for 60. So if I'm a lender, 
The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bump that 60 to 100. I'm going yeah, to we just want to see his um, deal spec sheet and the perfect loan proposal. I actually talked to Bobby yesterday. He wasn't able to upload it because of upload limits, but um, I got it. he has got it, it all ready to go. Yeah, I got it. Hold on. I'm one step ahead of you, Stephen. So let's look at his deal sheet. There we go. There's the deal. Hell of a, I mean, he does a great job with these packets. All right. So we got popcorn ceiling. So it is brown and green. Got some numbers here. Roof's 12 years old, windows are 20 plus years old, furnace is new, hot water tank's new, plumbing's good, CMA appraisal. So it did get an appraisal. So, you know, you can, I'm just trying to do this quick. Loan price, here we go, it's full scope work. All right, so I would review this, but let's just say I'm playing devil's advocate as a lender, Chris, you know, cause I'm trying to really yeah. underwrite this. I'm still gonna probably add some additional and say that it's a hundred grand. But I mean, how many of you think that this is a pretty good packet that he's put together here? I think it's phenomenal. I mean, it's a nice house, isn't it? A really nice house. Look at that thing. It's a beautiful house. 18 acres, man. Can't beat that. I mean, this is this is a good deal. This is a great patio pond view. I mean, look at that. Two buildings on site. Look at that. You got the buildings for the lawnmowers. Here's Zoffer, 12% annual interest, nine-month term. Lean options for lenders, first position, promissory note, personal guarantee. See that? Right there, Chris. That is the ultimate. Boom. Personal guarantee. So I'd ask for his, his uh, personal financial statement. If that personal financial statement looks good, nothing else is more important to me than first lean position and a personal guarantee because that puts Bobby fully on the hook. He's out to dry. If he screws this thing up, he is screwed screwed so you know good that's a good packet all right so now let's underwrite this deal so chris here's how i'd look at this first off the markets are probably going to go down uh, i i can't remember where this deal was uh where the hell was that probably south carolina but south carolina so let's just assume south carolina and i'm going to kind of go heavy let's just say it pulls back uh it is south carolina let's just do 30 percent off that's pretty heavy, okay? But let's just do the math. 710,000 minus 30%. 30% in nine months would be a heck of a drop too. It would. But I mean, I'm just, Chris, if you were like super nervous Nelly about it, let's just say 497, okay? He's buying it for 422. And I'm, I bumped him from, I think his thing said 65. I bumped him from 65 to 100. So if it's 497, 422 plus 100, 522. If I was really kind of thinking that was realistic, he's upside down, okay? So how would I do that? Would I still lend on this deal? Yeah, because I don't think this is going to happen. But would I lend the full 425? No. So I might go to him and say, hey, listen, I've run my numbers. I don't think your valuation is going to hold up in this next market downturn. I think in nine months, this would never fly, but that's this. I'm not going to lend 425. I'm comfortable lending $370,000. So now, if I'm going to lend 370, I, I might even, you could even redline that. Maybe you say, hey, I'm comfortable lending 400. Okay. So I'm, I'm comfortable lending 400 on the house that probably will be worth 497. Then he's got to put the rehab money in or some of the rehab money in, plus he's got 22 grand. Now he can go with that or he can not, but that would might be what I propose. But in nine months, you're right, Stephen, this would be aggressive. So maybe 20% would be a better number. So you can you can noodle your numbers. You could kind of just look at it and say, all right, at 20%, that brings this to this brings this to 568. So 568. So, you know, and then you, you, he's asking for 425 is what he's looking for out of the deal. If it's worth 568, and then he's got to put a hundred in, I'm still okay. So maybe then I could lend the 425. So that's how I would underwrite it. So this is actually a pretty solid deal, a really solid deal. Because if it's right now appraised at 710 and I take 20% off of that at 568 that you know assumes market fallout and he's only borrowing 425, even if I up the amount, I'm still good, okay? I'm still good because I know at 425, he's buying it for 422. I'm giving him the money to purchase it. He's using his own money for the rehab. My only risk in this equation is that he doesn't do any rehab. That's it. That's the only risk. But I'm still protected by the price of the asset, even in a declining market. Secondarily, 
The second thing I'm going to be asking him about, okay, is I'm going to say, okay, what is your plan B? So I know his first plan is to refinance because he's going to keep this long-term as a rental. Uh, so plan number one is a refi. So let's go, I go to Bobby and I say, what happens if plan number one doesn't work? What's plan number two? He might say, well, I might fire sell and flip it. Okay, what if you can't flip it? Then he comes and he says, well, then I would raise, I would raise additional second round of money at 15% to buy you out. As long as I've got one, two, three options, I mean, I still think he's going to be okay on option one, which is his plan. But as long as I've got three options, I'm feeling a lot better as a lender because no matter what, Chris, I've got the asset. I'm in first lean position. I got the asset. So regardless of what happens, as long as I did my math and it made sense, I'm feeling a lot better. But Bobby went bankrupt with the economy crash like everybody else did. Doesn't matter. So we can, we can play. So I can see your comments. Um, Write your fears in the numbers. Oh, yeah, yeah, Chris. So just, I do everything with math. I just, all of it's math. If Bobby goes bankrupt, it doesn't matter to me. I get the house. Sure, do I, maybe I don't want the house, but like that's, that's worst case scenario. Bobby goes bankrupt. I'm a lien holder on this house. Not only that, I got a personal guarantor on, on his personal assets. So I might not be priority on his personal assets if he goes bankrupt, but the bankruptcy courts, when he files chapter 11 or whatever chapter he files is going to pay me some of my money because I got a personal guarantee from him saying he's going to pay me it. Secondarily, I got the asset, which now becomes mine. This house now becomes Chris Noggle's house or Chris G's house. Okay. So it doesn't matter how you look at this. You've already run the math. So this house pencils so that the amount I'm lending is supported by even a fallout in the price of the property. I'd be okay owning that house. What else do we got here? Mark Johnson, keep getting emails and seminars about getting into tax liens. What do you think of them? Mark, I'm not really an expert in tax liens, to be quite honest. So I don't really have an opinion, nor do I really want to comment on it, just because it's not an area that I know, like, and understand. I know a lot of people are doing it. Uh, you're probably getting a lot of people messaging you about that because, you know, there's, I don't know, coaching programs that people are trying to sell tax liens, there's, there's going to be more and more of those as the market deteriorates. It's going to be more and more foreclosures and everything else. Steven, you want to get Martha over your info? And, and folks also here, just let me do a call out right now. Um, if any of you have interest in speaking to us about the infinite banking concept or private money club, we're going to put the link up right now so that you guys can check it out. Um, and I'll get Matthew's question in a second. So you can talk about private money club. You can talk about the infinite banking concept and the specially designed whole life. So we'll put the link up. You can schedule a call with us about that. Uh, the other thing too, that I, I would be remiss not to say when we got most of the people on, all of you deserve a vacation. And you, if you're going to take a vacation, you should do it with the right people, people that are thinking the way you are, people that are ready to get you ready for where you're going. So how many of you want to take a vacation with me and Steven and our whole team? You want to take like what, not just a vacation, like, let me just paint a picture. How about this? We're going to go to Mexico. Okay. You're going to fly into Mexico to Cancun. When you get off the airplane and you walk outside, there's going to be a black car. Somebody's going to have a name on your car. They're going to pick you up. You're going to get in the car. Okay. They're going to give you water, a uh, nice warm towel for your face and your hands. Cause you know, Mexico might be a long flight for you. That's going to take you 45 minutes to a place that's way off the beaten path. And you're going to go back and all gated. You're going to go through security and you're going to arrive at this place that the only words to describe it are paradise. Somebody's going to open the door for you. You're going to get out. They're going to hand you champagne or whatever drink you'd like. And you're going to meet your butler. That's right, your butler. Your butler is going to be with you the entire time to make sure you get whatever you want, go wherever you want, anything you want. Well, within reason, okay? No pimp stuff. But anything you want, they're going to give you. And then you're going to spend the next three days poolside, oceanside, and also out on some really cool excursions, some really cool experiences with us. The entire time, what we're going to be talking about is money, finances, all the stuff you heard about for an hour and a half today. We're going to do that for three days, but we're also going to have speakers like Kelly Cardenas talking about other stuff. And we're, we're not going to spend any time sitting in like hotel uh, freezing cold conventions, we're going to spend all of our time out in at the pool or at the ocean or at the cabanas or out in excursions. And we're still going to be talking about this stuff, but we're going to talk about it in fun settings.
because hey, this is a vacation in paradise. Why are we going to sit inside in freezing cold air conditioning in nice clothes? No, we're going to be we're going to be by the pool or somewhere fun, and we're still going to be doing all this stuff with a whole bunch of high level people. There are four seats left. That is it, four, not not one more. I'm not just saying that. It's five thousand dollars. The only thing you need to figure out is where the five thousand is coming from for you. If you want to bring a spouse, it's or a business partner, it's half off for them. Okay, five grand. Plus, you got to pay for your air, airplane. Everything else is covered in the five grand. Your ride from the airport to the hotel, your butler, your 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 hotels. Uh, it's not a hotel room. It's a villa. You're going to get a villa. That's all covered. Everything is all inclusive. So all your meals at the Italian restaurant, at the sushi restaurant. Maybe you want to go to the Thai restaurant. Maybe you want the 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 uh, want, want some American food. Maybe you want pizza. Whatever you want, it's all covered. Okay, all the excursions covered, including the cost to get there and everything else. You pay for nothing, maybe tips, bring some money for tips. Cause you know, in Mexico, if you tip them, you get, you get a lot, but we're going to have a great time. We're down to four seats. So if there's four of you on here that want to join us, the dates are March 31st to, or, or to April 4th, March 31st, to April 4th. I think Steven put the, uh, the link in there. So we put his link for community. If you guys want to book a call with him. So I'm going to repost that because we got a lot of messages that just came in. So there's that. And the week after your birthday, there we go. So I'm just going to pull the link up and show you guys some things from the link. So we call it the experience. Many people on here have joined us at the other places. So this is wrong. There's only four. The mastermind I just went to, somebody's going to be joining us from there. This is like the center area. There's water everywhere. This is the buffet, the gym. This actually, I'm sorry, looking back, this is the Thai restaurant up here. Uh, I believe that's the gym. I'm forgetting it. This is the cabanas that we'll be hanging out with on the beach. These are the, all the different pools. These are the villas we're going to be staying in. Okay, this is what they look like from poolside. This is the gym. I mean, I, I, me and Larissa own a place here, which is why we're going here. I haven't been here since the pandemic, but that's exactly what the rooms look like. This is exactly what it looks like when you walk outside your room, if you're on the front first floor there. This is like the little area where you go out and get photos. I'll be in the water, folks, but you guys can go out there and hang out in that little thing. Um, this is this is uh, one of the restaurants that overlooks the infinity pools that overlook the ocean. And there's the infinity pools that overlook the ocean. Oh yeah, that's a bar. I mean, how many of you like sitting in the pool and having people bring you drinks? Pretty cool, right? This is in the Grove. So we, we'll definitely spend some time there. There's a Grove. So if you're eating here, the only thing I want to, if you're going to eat by the Grove, just know that the monkeys are probably going to take your food. And if you try to share with the monkeys, they will definitely take all of your food. They're pretty friendly, but they'll eat your food and take your hat and anything that you want to let them take, they will. So be careful with the monkeys. Okay. But the monkeys, hey, they're part of it. It's their place, just like it's yours. Here's the agenda, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then videos, the crew, the reviews, all the different speakers, Randy Garn, Kelly, Brent, myself. And then we've got a mystery speaker that's going to be coming, which we never really tell you who it's going to be. So there you go, folks. It's a very, very, very inexpensive vacation, but a very high level vacation. So I don't want you to think the five grand price. You know, some of you are like, well, that's not cheap. Well, really, you book that. Try to go there yourself and add everything up. You're probably going to spend more than five grand with the excursions and the experiences, but we can do it cheaper because we've got a group. So we're going down there and we've got 40 people with the staff. So because we're doing a group, we were able to really, really make it happen. And there's payment plans still. So you can uh, structure that out and do the payment plans on that. But I wanted to make sure I, I gave that to all of you because that's going to be one hell of an amazing trip. And then we can really dive into everybody's uh, unique situations, poolside, oceanside, anywhere side, but just doing cool things in paradise. So hopefully four of you will be joining us with the rest of us that are going there. But as we kind of wrap up, Stephen, what else uh, do we need to hit here? Well, I think that's uh, I think that's about it, man. That was that was really good today. Yeah, sorry. I, I tend to just kind of go on these tangents and go down the, the rabbit hole, but I love the questions because when the questions come in, it allows me to really hit each individual situation, and I, I love that. Now, Matthew had a question. He said, hi, Stephen. I downloaded it and signed it 
but only show a few new deals asking if you're interested. Yeah, so he's just asking about the app when it's going to, when it's going to show like more oh. of the stuff, like the website. So I was just saying, we're just waiting for the approval from Apple and yeah. it'll have all the deals. It'll have messaging. Um, it'll have a link for the learn section, which will be updated on the site uh, very soon as well. So uh, I would say within the next couple of weeks, that'll all be good to go. Two less tickets for Cancun. So Mary and I are waiting for Shauna to return and send the invoice for, all right. So there's not four, there's two seats left. So sorry about that, but uh, two of you can now join us in uh, the experience. And then Who it's is that? Uh, anonymous. I don't know. It says anonymous. Yeah. Part of the problem with the experience is we, we usually only allow 25 people. And as we keep doing more and more experiences and people come and they have like an amazing time, they always buy the next one before they leave the, the last one. So as this keeps going, eventually we won't even have any new seats for future experiences because they'll all be taken by either fractional CFO members or people that have already gone to the experience that just continue to go. And I know like for the masterminds that I do, if I really love it, I always buy ahead anyway for the next ones as well. So I do the same thing unless something comes up. So there we go. Awesome, folks. Well, I hope this was uh, helpful. I really want you to think long and hard about what we talked about with debts, because I'm, I'm dead serious. Like this is the end of a long-term debt cycle. There's a lot of major problems going on out there and I'm sure you already see it, but you gotta focus on that. You gotta find monies that are in places that you're not using and we gotta really focus on getting the debts paid down. And then don't just pay your debts down, recycle and recapture the money you're giving away. And if you really wanna get good at it, book a call with Steve and I'll put his link up one more time uh is the passport needed yeah it's mexico so yes you need a passport uh, <laughs> <laughs> shoot uh there you go so there's there's steven's uh link can your son come sure you just you know you just it's just half off for your son so you would pay for one ticket for yourself and then your son would be half off so if you go to that link uh steven you want to put that link in there again if you if you go to the link it'll explain the different options for bringing your son with you but that would be wild like that would be wild to, to have your son there your son We'll just have just the most unbelievable time, but also learn some things that will last a lifetime. I think that's a phenomenal idea. You know, having a, a daughter at two and a half, like I want her to start experiencing these things so she can get around these high level people and start thinking like that. So anyway, we may not have any tickets left after today, which would be great. Then we won't have to talk about it anymore. And everybody else will just have to just wait for March 31st for that epic trip. Uh, to the next experience in Playa del Carmen, Mexico at the resort, which is called Azul Fives, A-Z-U-L Fives. And that's the beachfront property. So you can check that out online. But hopefully you guys join us. And uh, with that being said, thanks. We'll see you. Actually, any questions we didn't get, join us 4.30 this afternoon for the Ask Me Anything Happy Hour. It goes on every single week after the Wealth Webinar. We uh, kick back. The whole team comes on, we answer your questions. And if you wanna join us, there's no cost. You just either gotta to subscribe to my YouTube channel and my YouTube channel is at the Chris Noggle or be part of the Facebook group for Money School if you're part of MSTV or just the Infinite Banking Facebook group or any of my Facebook pages that you're a friend of mine, you'll be notified. So we'll see you at 4.30 Eastern this afternoon outside of that. Thanks everybody. And Stephen, thank you for your time. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them. But I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you want to know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button. Actually, smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.